welcome to the Aftershock with Colin Ennire and Philip Leva. We join you tonight after a two to one loss on the road for the San Jose Earthquakes against the Houston Dynamo. Colin, the Quakes come out firing. They score a goal in the first minute, 59 seconds in off of a corner kick. Christian Espinoza delivers a gem on a platter for Bruno Wilson, who puts it into the back of the net. And the Earthquakes start the match on the front foot. However, as you know, oftentimes on the road, when you get the lead, what ends up happening is a team bunkers. They try to prevent the other team from scoring with the hope that they'll get at least one point. In the 33rd minute, Preston Judd gets a red card. Um, Colin, let's start there. So the red card call, what's your verdict on on that? Uh, no reason to complain for San Jose fans. It's not to say that it's a super harsh, horrible you know, red card or anything. Uh, it's not to say that you know Preston Judd shouldn't have thought differently about it. The fact is the rules are pretty clear about such things. If you go with a fist or an elbow and you kind of swing it at an opponent like that, you're going to get a red card. You know, you don't have to hit them particularly hard. You don't have to do it in a way that, you know, seems super extravagant. It's just one of those by the book things. And uh, so for me, the only what only person that San Jose fans can be upset with is Preston Judd. Uh, and it's funny because I was texting somebody at the club during the first half being like, man, Preston, du Preston Judd's a dog, like in a positive way, meaning, you know, he's really getting into it. He's pressing, he's physical, he's getting involved in a way that, you know, I, I think is the sign of a good player. But then you see a little edge on him that's that's the kind of thing that comes with those types of players sometimes. Uh, and he put his uh, whole team kind of uh, in a bad situation thereafter. We can analyze exactly everything that went down after that, the things that worked and were positive, the things that didn't work that weren't positive. But fundamentally, that game was defined by that decision off the ball. Uh, he did something that you should just know that you can't do, especially in the VAR era, where you know that they have a camera that's going to see it. This is not something you can get away with anymore. Yeah, absolutely agree there. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a tough situation. It puts Lucci in a tough situation as well, right? But... You know, prior to that moment, just watching the match and how things were working in the midfield, I think that there was still a little bit of, uh, you know, cohesiveness lacking between the three central midfielders. I noticed that For we sure. hardly even saw Nico Chakiris on the ball at all in the you know, in that part of the match, you know, from the about the first minute all the way up until the 33rd minute. So I wasn't surprised when we saw N Nico come out. But I'm curious as to what, you know, his role was through throughout that, uh, because we didn't see him trying to make any of those, you know, probing passes, the sorts of things that Lucci likes to see, breaking lines, being creative, being that playmaker that we know Nico can be. So uh, it really just came down to the Quakes like, setting up a block the entire time, um, which, I mean, transitioning to playing with 10 men right after that, there wasn't a whole lot different that was going on afterwards. And we saw a couple of substitutes, a couple of different players that came on, but it seemed like throughout this match, San Jose was playing defensively um but i'm curious colin was there any moment in this match where you thought maybe san jose could have come away with a point at least or perhaps even three oh, yeah. points because they did keep houston from scoring all the way up until about the 80th minute and then oh, it was from that point on where really they were able to batter the quakes and take all three points yeah and, and well one thing i will say is you know and in some ways it's tempting to be like well they lasted until the 80th minute so they you know they got pretty close we all know in modern you know in modern soccer there's a lot of stoppage time. The 80th minute, you're talking, you got at least 15, maybe 20 minutes to, to still cover. So you didn't actually get that close to the end uh, if you conceded at 80. And it's a very dangerous time immediately after that first concession, if you've been bunkering and protecting for a very, very, very long time, and all of a sudden the dam breaks, those those minutes right after that are always very vulnerable because that's a it's really tough mentally to absorb that kind of devastating blow and then get right back into it and be able to protect the way that you need to protect. So it was not surprising to me that the second goal came very shortly thereafter. Uh, what I will say, mm -hmm. though, is, is positively and negatively. So, look, uh, bunkering, especially when you're up a goal on the road, down a man. Nothing specifically wrong with that. And I, I, I took a positive and a negative for how this approached uh, from the rest of the game. The positive is the, the structure looks very sound. And that's what Lucci has clearly been working on is a structure that they can, you know, they can fall back into if they need it, something they can rely on and something they can build on. And that structure is two banks of four. Um, and it was interesting because the commentators you know, said, oh, they're switching to three at the back because they saw Tanner Beeson coming on because he usually plays center back. Uh, clearly, that wasn't his role. He went in and left back. Victor Costa, uh, Victor Costa pushed up as to a left midfielder. Jamar Ricketts came in later as a left midfielder. 
And you saw that when they were sitting, they were sitting in those two banks of four. That's a really solid defensive shape. The team looks mm -hmm. good in that defensive shape. Even in the beginning of the game before that, you know, Nico and Jackson were playing kind of as free floating tens in front of uh, Alfredo Morales when they had possession. But when they didn't have possession, again, you see them set up those two banks of four. Nico is playing kind of as more of the attacking, Jackson playing a little bit deeper. So, first of all, I want to thank Brian uh, Hoover for making like a little bit of joy here out of a unpleasant game. Put in your funniest joke uh, in your in your bonus here, and and we'll read it out. On that. <laughs> um, but the the point is that structure positive, and the, and they played it well. They looked good in it. They looked solid in it. The thing that I had a problem with is the the mentality uh, that was shown was strong for a minute, uh, but then it did mm -hmm. eventually break. And there was a lot of things in here that made me concerned about mentality. One is Jackson Ewell getting a very dumb yellow card at the very end after getting a dumb yellow card for, you know, dissent. You know, that, that's not necessarily a position you want to put yourself in. Carlos Cruzo getting a dumb yellow card. That's not a position you want to put yourself in. But more importantly, what you see is they fe fell farther and farther and farther and farther back. They got deeper and deeper and deeper. And one of the problems that this leads to is it means there's no pressure on guys who are just outside the box. And that can be a very dangerous space to be in. But then the second problem is if you completely uh, do away with any sense of attack whatsoever, you've actually lost a valuable defensive tool for relieving pressure. It, you know, they, it's one of the things that modern soccer coaches talk about is like the best defense is a good attack. The best attack is a good defense. Like they play off of each other. If there was some kind of release valve where they could get the ball and present some danger, then Houston has to pin itself farther back. It can't be quite as so adventurous. But the fact that they kept on getting deeper and deeper meant the engagements were lower and there was no threat going the other way. The, it seemed like Lucci was yelling at his guys to push a little bit higher up. So that you know that might be one of those things it's where it's unclear what Lucci wanted versus what the players wanted. Maybe we'll ask him at the press conference about it. But that, that was the concerning thing. And the way that things kind of disintegrated into frustration after that first goal, quick concession of another one, dumb fouls, you know, th th that kind of thing, it kind of disintegrated. So I think yeah, it was I, I, structure, negative about the way that it kind of went to, uh, you know, went to seed at the very end. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Colin, like in a way when they came out with this really aggressive mentality, right? There were early yellow cards for the quakes. It was almost like not surprising that that really egregious foul ended up happening. You know, obviously it was disappointing seeing uh, Preston Judd being taken out because of the red card. But the Quakes did come out playing quite aggressively. I mean, it's no accident yeah. that they scored in the first minute. Um, if you go back and watch the footage from that, they were playing on the front foot. They were running right at Houston. It was every bit of what we expected, uh, considering what Lucci was saying about wanting to, you know, make a uh, an impact right away against these teams on the road, so that you can get points. So the the Judd red card definitely like threw them. Threw them yeah. off, right? It took it took a lot out of the you know, out of what their their process was in terms of like coming out and playing aggressively. Because then after that point, they continued to press the issue, and it just made things rather worse. And especially considering the way that the referee was judging this match, it, it kind of seemed like he wasn't really taking the time to speak to the players to settle things down. He was kind of allowing things to happen, which in some cases can be really good. But when you're playing on the road and you don't have the crowd with you. You know, sometimes you lose your head. You become vulnerable to those types of calls. And I think that's what happened there with Judd. Um, I mean, who knows what was going on in his mind at that moment? It's a really foolish foul for him to commit. Yep. Um, but that's what happens there with Judd. I think he hit it right on the head. The same thing with Jackson Yule. You know, uh, it seemed like the guys could have just used a little bit of leadership, perhaps a little bit more patience and some of those more challenging situations. I mean, they almost made it to the end of the match and escaped with at least a point. Um, they nearly came out of there with three points after playing a man down for sure. like an hour, which is incredible. And that's a huge positive to take away from this match. But again, um, when you don't have Morales in there as the it's sort of like marshalling that part of the defensive midfield, the midfield in general, and even in front of the back line, I think it takes a lot out. And I'm starting to realize that Morales is actually a really important key, a really important yeah. part of this team. And I think that Carlos Grueso just doesn't necessarily provide that. I know that we've repeated that in other episodes. And look, Grueso is a skilled player. There are certain things that he does well. But what this team needs right now is that leadership in that position. And I feel like Jackson Yule works really well with that, too. And we saw some really great movement from Yule kind of moving in that eight position tonight. Yeah, Yule looks better and, with and going Morales. Back and, 
Exactly. Exactly. He looks a lot better with Morales than he does with Gruezo. So um, I actually, one thing I'm really curious about moving forward, and maybe we can, we can talk to Lucci about this in the press conference is like um, going into the match against Austin FC, what kinds of changes are going to be necessary? What kind of, not just necessary, but like, you know, uh, what is he going to be left with? essentially yeah. so um there's a there's a lot lacking at this point when you don't have jackson yule and then preston judd as well as even playing thankfully you have a player who is more than competent a good player like jeremy abobasi to step in and play that position but it's clear to me that the quakes are going to be they're going to be struggling to put together a pretty good squad for this upcoming road match against austin yeah well, the, the the what you said earlier is the the midfield didn't really have that kind of cohesion and possession. They got a little bit of that against Seattle last week, where you could see the midfield sort of connecting and working, and we didn't really see it working this week, even when they were on the front foot. There was good aggression, good physicality, but you know, possession and keeping the ball and progressing it well, you know, not not so much. But for me, that's actually something that you expect to kind of grow and develop with time. And some days you have it, and some days you don't. One, the one thing that's constant is solid defensive structure and, and people knowing where they need to be and playing the rules that they need to play. And that all was there for most of this game. And by the way, the other big beneficial thing, and we've seen some of the comments in the chat already mentioned it, is, you know, William Yarbrough looks like an adequate replacement for Danielle. You know, by the way, I, you know, I don't think we should expect Yarbrough to be a savior every single game of the season. Danielle, last season's, his statistics were absolutely spectacular. So, you know, maybe we're not going to get that, but if we can at least get something decent there and the structure of the team is solid, then that's a foundation you can build on. That's a foundation you can build on tactically for Lucci, but it's also a foundation you can build on for the front office to bring in the kinds of players and attack who are going to make the difference. Uh, and so I think that if as long as that kind of fundamental structure is there, this team has a chance uh, tactically and otherwise. The other problem is mentality. And I think that, you know, they, they have some work to do to make sure that they have the discipline, the motivation, the strength to to kind of get through these times. Um, but so everybody kind of has their role there. The players need to, you know, get into a place where they can ride out these problems mentally. You know, Lucci has to do a, build something on top of that solid structure. And the technical staff has to give him some some more, you know, firepower and attack. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, there's still one key part missing, right? And it is that it's that one attacking piece. Like that's the one thing you can't rely on an 18 year old, even though he is incredibly talented and he brings a lot to this team. You can't rely on that player to be the one who is going to be your game changer. And I think we saw a little bit of that tonight. I mean, he was invisible. I think going 30 minutes in, I was looking at the stats and he had six touches. That's and that's not all on him necessarily. But we're also talking about off the ball movement. How can he find sure. ways to get involved? And I think a more experienced player um, is able to get more involved in, in the play. And I, I just think that that's, again, going back to what we've been saying since the very beginning of the season, that's the one spot, that's the one key area that's missing. And it doesn't hurt, too, to have somebody that Nico Chikaris can learn from uh, to play in that role, right? And, uh, you know, just thinking about the one of the things that you mentioned, Colin, when you're looking over the salary and how the earthquakes have determined who to spend um, money on and which spots to fill. There are actually other spots for for young, talented players in this squad oh, yeah. that are not currently being occupied, right? Um, maybe you can talk about that a little bit for the folks who don't quite understand how the U uh, 22 designation initiative works. Yeah, so I, look, the, the, the fundamental point, if you don't care about the details, the quakes have the resources to go out and get one like big star and and up to three young players who have potential but not necessarily the big established guys uh they, they have the resources to do that for first of all they have plenty of resources in terms of gam uh and cap resources you know i think that they had room even not accounting for Cade's transfer but when Cade transfer out of the league uh, a portion of that gets con something circa a million maybe it's a million and a bit uh into gam uh so that actually expands their ability to like put these on cap players there are there's a DP spot completely wide open. There's three U22 slots completely wide open. U22 slots are something you can pay a transfer fee, and the transfer fee doesn't hit the cap and a salary, but the salary has to be below six hundred thousand dollars and and change. So that's kind of typically what you would get is for a younger player who's not commanding high wages at this point in his life, but might have a big transfer fee associated with them uh, because he might have a lot of potential. For the DP, it can be you know as big of a fee and as big of a salary as you so please. The one uh, nuance that we posted on the Twitter just so that people understand is 
under the current rules, if a designated player is above 1.6 million in his cap hit, they can't use the full suite of U22 slots. Uh, so it would have to either be under that or a young DP or some other thing. Colin, it looks like we're going over to the uh, press conference here. Just Fair so enough. You know. Doesn't matter. The point is that they can bring guys in and, and the technicalities are ironing themselves out relatively soon. So Phil's going to cool. queue up this we'll press conference. Press we have conference. a, a yeah. there we go. There we go. <laughs> Uh, audio issues here, Colin. So give me just a sec. I'll see if I can get it figured out. Well, Phil's chewing on the uh, on the audio elements of this. I'll just finish brief with my thought, which is uh, that the U22 DP interaction that I was talking about just now is something that is likely to change over the summer. And Tom Bogert reported that. So even that uh, distinction won't prevent the Quakes from, from using it later on. Uh, and Phil, if you check the private chat, Jamin has a little advice here. Oh, there we go. Y trabajaría bien esta semana. Uh, a ver los errores que hemos hecho, Mire. las cosas buenas también, y intentar ganar ya el próximo partido. La última pregunta eh, de Telemundo, eh, si puede describir su primer gol con San Jose. Uh, un poco, en Portugal nos, nosotros decimos Agri 12, que es como que muy, me, ha senti, me he sentido muy, muy feliz por hacer el gol, el primer, y quiero hacer muchos más, pero... Lo más importante es el resultado del equipo y perdimos, entonces por eso no, no me quedo tan feliz. I will start here in, with one question uh, in person from uh, Chris Cator from uh, Africa Sports Network. Chris? Yeah. Hi, Bruno. Hi. Yeah, amazing goal in the first one minute. You kind of shook the whole team tonight, but your team failed to win the game to the first shot to go to one. What do you think about the game? uh yes we we start very well um with a early goal but after the the red card was a tough game difficult game we have to to be warriors inside inside that pitch and uh we did our best was not enough uh but we we just now have to to watch the game again analyze see the the mistakes and change for the next game to, to try to win. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. So how are you settling your new club? This is your first season in MLS. How are you settling in the United States? Uh, how, how what? How are you settling down? Como está, como, uh, como si se uh, 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 the very, yeah, very well. Uh, the people here in uh, San Jose Earthquakes, they are very kind. They receive me very well. And uh, I feel in home already. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one question um, from Jamin Moore from Quake's Epicenter. Uh, first of all, he says he congratulates you on the goal. Um, and how did you feel the team did, especially with only 10 men for most of the game? I think the, the team did very well uh, with the 10 players. It's very difficult, this situation you have just to, to defend. We are winning so you have to defend your goal try to, to do your best in transitions create some opportunities too uh but was a tough game i think that we we were a little bit unlucky i think in the goals that we suffer uh but football football soccer is is like this so uh, we just have to work uh, keep focus in our job and uh try to to win the the next game We'll now take a question from Philip Leva from Quake's Epicenter. Philip? Unmuted. Thank you. 
muted. Yeah, I I have a good night. First of all, uh, I have um, a very good relationship with uh, William, with Rodriguez. I think uh, because I'm a, I'm that type of person. Uh, I like to to talk with my my teammates to uh, to like pass the day with them and know them uh, because uh the truth is that i i pass more time with them than uh, with my real family uh they are my second family or my first family because i pass more time with with them so i have a, a very good relationship um and yeah that's it uh we'll take another question from alex morgan quite Center. Hi, Bruno. Thanks for, for joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to speak with you. Uh, I, I'm curious, I, I want to ask one question about, uh, you know, the, the, the period before the red card, uh, because it felt like the team, you know, offensively was creating good transitions going forward and working through, uh, through Preston up top, uh, and then defensively was, was recovering well as well. So I want to know what you thought about those first 30 minutes, what the, the game plan was, and how you thought you executed on that. Um... Good night, uh, Alex. I think um, after the goal, until the goal, we we start very well, and after the goal, I think um, we defend a, a little bit down, more down that that we want, but it's part of the game. Um, but we feel that we can can hurt them in transitions. Um, but after, with the red card, was more more difficult and uh, change the game. And uh, last question from Alex Morgan of Quake's episode. Yeah, and just to follow up, I'm curious what the conversations were like at halftime. It felt like the team had already shifted a little bit uh, to a more defensive approach when, when Tanner Beeson came on near the end of the first half. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, what that balance you were trying to strike what was between parking the bus and maybe leaving some room for, for counterattacks. We didn't. We didn't try to park the bus, but uh, they have a good team too, uh, with a lot of offensive offensive players. Um, and Tanner did a very, a very well, good job, very good job, uh, closing the, that left side, um, because uh, we we try to play like with the ball with three, me in the middle and Rodriguez in the right, and uh, Tanner left. Uh, but we don't have too much the ball, um, so we try to defend too with a tenor with like a, a left back because um, their right back is is too high, uh, was too high all, all the game, and is a, a very offensive player, and Carrasquilla is a dangerous player too. Uh, but after I think it's it's part of the game when you are without without one player, with less one player. Uh, you you just want to defend, and after you don't have legs to go up in transition and create opportunities because you get tired. Um, but we did our best, and I'm very proud of my team um, because we had a, a very good attitude trying to to don't lose the game, but uh, what was not possible, and now. Uh, focus already in the in the next game to to try to change this situation. This concludes this portion of the press conference post game versus Houston. We will have head coach Luchi Gonzalez shortly. And we're back. Yeah. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get the audio clip on the next yeah. one. Big shout to Phil, just for everybody in the chat. I, I post in the chat too, but he is producing slash hosting today, and, and for the first yeah. time too. So this is not an easy task. Uh, so well done. Yeah, figuring out the audio stuff is a little tricky. Just you know, for folks who have <laughs> ever used StreamYard the before. Yeah. Yeah, well, because the um, like Google Chrome wants to take the audio and use it in one program, but not the other. So it's like trying to yeah. figure out how to quickly switch it between the two. So that's basically what was going on. You nailed there. it. So hopefully it won't take us as long. Thanks. Um, also, thank, thank you. you for the donation. Uh, is Bandamage? I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I've, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know I I've seen that. you around social media for a long time. And, uh, and anyway, uh, just really appreciate 
your contribution to the show. So, um, so yeah. Anyway, let's let's get back into stuff. our conversation about about the game here. Um, Bruno talking about them being in a, you know an incredibly difficult situation and praising his teammates at the same time. And you love the comment that he makes about you know uh, one reality that we don't think about a lot is that. The, these players have to spend a lot of time with each other so much so that they're actually spending more time with their other with their teammates than their family at times and so their teammates are kind of like a proxy they you know they become their family so um just talking about that relationship with Rodriguez and William Yarborough and how important that is to him and so I thought that was kind of a nice moment from Bruno yeah. Wilson um uh, but you know also, also three talking languages about he speaks three yeah. languages really well that we know about mm -hmm. and God knows what else. No, he's a really impressive guy. Yeah, no, I thought that was really impressive as well. So um, just general thoughts, Colin, following up. It's not a surprise that he was the one who came into the presser. Oftentimes when we do these press conferences, we get to talk to players who scored in the match. So yep. just general thoughts about Bruno, um, aside from the fact that he has an impressive ability to speak three languages. No, I, I really like him as a player, too. I, I'll be very interested to see when we get the MLSPA uh, salary report exactly what he's on. But I, I think the Quakes might have done a very, very oh, nice. It looks like we're getting, getting Luigi Gonzalez right as you get oh, started. There we go. Never mind. <laughs> we'll switch over. We'll, we'll get back into what Bruno said, too. All right, well, actually, by the way, the one thing that stood out to Bruno that we'll, we'll post Mark is, uh, is the depth uh, of the defense. Coach, uh, muy valiente los once. Pero después de la tarjeta rota fue muy difícil para defender. Uh, ¿Qué piensas tú sobre el partido? Sí, es un difícil partido. No, ni siquiera quiero verlo en la estadística porque con un hombre menos se cambia la estrategia. Empezamos muy bien. Hemos empezado de los seis partidos, cuatro partidos muy bien con goles para empezar. Y, y bueno, En el, en el juego nos cuesta eh, seguir ganando y seguir teniendo el, el tipo de, de, de ritmo y, y organización que nos, nos, nos da la victoria y, y estamos perdiendo demasiadas lesiones. Hoy día perdemos lesión con, con una tarjeta roja donde es ni siquiera un duelo, es un, es un momento emocional y con el VAR no, no, no podemos hacer esos tipos de cosas porque el bar ve todo y, y bueno, perdemos la concentración, perdemos la cabeza en ese momento y un hombre menos y cambia la dinámica del juego. Mira, muy orgulloso los chicos, dejaron toda la cancha y tengo que ser muy, muy feliz con sus esfuerzos. Y la táctica funcionó hasta, hasta que no funcionó con el gol, el primer gol, que fue una, una deflexión, un, un disparo bloqueado y cambia la dirección del aparato y no puede hacer nada William. Eh, pero bueno, otra lección, otro eh, partido donde estábamos ganando y no, no cerramos el juego, pero mira, soy orgulloso todo el, con estos chicos porque dejan, dejaron todo para eh, en la cancha, pusieron buenísimo esfuerzo y, y este es un equipo donde es difícil ganarles o quitarle puntos con un hombre menos. Y, y me siento mal para los chicos porque pusieron buenísimo esfuerzo. We'll next go to Jamin Moore. Questions in English. This one is from Quakes App Center. Hi, Lucci. Um, obviously, you know, coming out uh, quick with a with another early goal on the road, you know, gives you the opportunity to be able to have you know your destiny in your hands for the rest of the match. Red card looked deserved from what we saw, um, and obviously put you guys in a tough position. Uh, you know, talk about maybe your thought process in terms of those earlier subs uh, before half and at the half and what you were thinking in terms of how that would affect the game and if it turned out as you expected. Thanks. Obviously, it didn't turn out as we expected. Uh, we lost. So, um, you know, but it was working until it didn't, until almost 80th minute. So, you know, I couldn't be more uh, proud and satisfied of the guy's effort. Um, you know, it's it's very disappointing to to have the lead be playing the way we were playing and against a team that's that's one of the, the best with the ball in the league and, and one and one of the best so far this season defensively to score early uh, was great. You know, we wanted to jump on, on them early and, and I thought we did. And then to, to have a man down, like you said, a red card, a deserved red card off the ball nowadays, the VAR kept everything. So it's really disappointing. We cannot we can't do that. 
right? It's, it's really disappointing to give that up. And it's going to be hard to, to be Houston in Houston with a man down so early in the game. So, so you know, we shot ourselves in the foot. I mean, the stats, this is a wash, statistically, the game, because we're just trying to defend in the middle of the block and, and uh, protect the goal. But, you know, happy, I'm happy with the guys' effort. Um, they gave everything physically, mentally, to, to try to keep keep the score the way it was. And then, it, like I said, I thought it was working till it till it didn't. So the subs and the, the ideas of players coming in was, was freshness and defensive organization to – we were varying in a 4 4 one, three, five, one moment, moments wide, trying to defend numbers wide, overloads wide, top of the box, get pressure on the ball, try to push the block out. It was hard. It was hard. Houston had good players, and they, they got their goal. So credit to them. But um, we're learning too many lessons. We, we've gone four out of six games hitting the first goal. And, 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 you know, for us to keep those leads, we have to focus better. We need to continue to do what we were doing when, before we scored our first goal. So – um, and this team has all that capacity. So they're disappointing. Um, we got to get over this one quick and, and, and show a response against Austin. Next question for Alex Morgan, Quake Step Center. Hey, Lucci, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I want to ask how you changed your approach once the red card happened and then continuously throughout the game, uh, specifically, you know, bringing on Tanner for Nico in the first half. What was the reason that you? prompted you to do that decision right then rather than waiting for halftime uh and you know how how difficult was it to to balance kind of the defensive needs while also trying to uh you know create some counter-attacking situations yeah look the first thing i told nico when when he came off was i'm sorry i'm sorry but because you know that definitely was not the plan he's the player that's only getting better and doing better for the team um and it's and so I was just you know we're disappointed that we had to take them off the field but but it was um, we put ourselves in that position and and look we it, it was for me it was a good decision because we we saw the half really out really well limiting their their chances and not Tanner with Vitor were or did the job um, and we had Benji who could play central and was busy was busy good in the air good, just just work hustled so you know it's tough to to. To make that change, uh, uh, lose a key midfielder, but we felt that's what we needed to do based on the circumstance. And, and like I said, it was working in, in, in a very effective way. Ricketts comes in and, again, puts in a good shift to to deal with two versus two or three versus two overloads wide with Tanner. And and we, I thought we did a pretty good job controlling that side. You know, they're still going to get their their dumped crosses in the box and the combos, but we we limited them. We created those from farther distances. So. Like I said, I thought I thought our setup and the changes we made were, were working until the moment it didn't. They get a you know weird kind of jammed ball in the in the edge of the six and a and a half turn shot that deflects and goes right in the side netting. It's super unfortunate and unlucky, I thought. But you know, over your man down, the our our, uh, our dam broke it and and they got the second one on a set piece. So. You know, it's tough. It's a tough one to swallow when, when we had three points. But you're a man down and we put ourselves we put ourselves in that position and we got to learn from it and, and prevent that moving forward. Last question from Philip Leva. Unmuted. Muted. It's a tough situation to come in the game, you know, like 50, 55th minute man down having to just help us defensively. You know, he is a converted left back and he's he's done he's done a great job in the preseason. That's why we signed him, that's why we drafted him. Uh mm -hmm. great mentality, great athlete, and very versatile. So, you know, uh we've I thought he put in a good shift. He he did the job that needed to be done, but it wasn't Collectively as a team, and we fell short. But um, I think he's got a great future, and uh, congrats to him to, to get his first pro minutes uh, with the first team. This concludes tonight's post game press conference versus Houston. That was an uh, abrupt ending there, but here we are. <laughs>
<laughs> Here we are. We're back in. All right, Colin. Uh, well, well, let's. By talk the way, just more. for the people in the chat, because obviously yeah. uh, I, we can't stream both the audio of you speaking and the 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 press conference at the same time, so they can't hear the question you asked. And so it was clearly oh, about okay. Jamar Ricketts. But if you want to fill yeah, that in, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I was essentially asking him um, how you know what his thoughts were regarding Jamar Ricketts' debut and uh, you know yeah. what his role with the team would be going forward, and just this basically his overall thoughts about, yeah. about him. So, well, actually, um, can I just do a little Jamar Ricketts bit? For, uh, we'll we'll yeah, go back absolutely. to actually, we'll go back to Lucy's presser. We'll go back to Bruno uh, Wilson's presser in a second. Um, briefly on Jamar Ricketts, I really like that kid's tape coming out of college. Like it was super fun. You know, he, he did, he was exciting. He was intense or whatever. I actually, obviously the role he's asked to play today is to stick to the left in a midfield, drop deep, track back, hold your position, you know, and try to fight for, you know, protect your goal for, I, I guess it was 25 minutes or so before everything kind of caved in. So not an ideal situation for a guy who started out as kind of a flare left winger. Um, but the the athleticism he showed tonight, uh, I thought was was very exciting. And actually, a specific, so like usually when we talk about athleticism, we're usually talking about people being fast uh, and he is fast. But the thing that impressed me was his ability to kill his momentum and stay balanced, you know, stay in a, in a position where he can continue engaging uh, with somebody while defending them. Uh, and that's a really essential piece of athleticism for a left back to have uh, for somebody who could, is going to be a defender. Uh, and by the way, as Lucci alluded to, he's never been a defender in his life until San Jose here at the pro level. He's been a left winger. So as they're converting him, that ability to kind of stick with his man and stop his momentum and stay in a position to stay engaged as a defender was very impressive to me. Obviously, you know, this is literally his first pro appearance. He's a, he's in a conversion project right now. But I did like what I saw from him um, in that respect. So uh, good job, Jamar. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on uh, on your pro debut. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and and I, I like that you mentioned the fact that he is converted. He showed a lot of competence in, in his work uh, yeah. going back and defending and and working with the squad. I think Lucci, in some of his comments, uh, expressed frustration in the fact that they were unable to keep it together towards the end of the match. But considering the options that he had and that he brought in a young player like Jamar Ricketts, who is not a natural defender, I thought he looked pretty great yep. in the match. And And let's face it, like, a lot of us Quakes fans, folks who've been following this team for so long, we are traumatized with the number of incompetent, you know, sure. fullbacks that have been on the squad over the over the years, right? Ever since the Justin Moore. Not the problem anymore, Stephen by the way. Bates or even, yeah. No, absolutely not a problem anymore. The, Let me be clear. Between the beta that, and like, Moro era to now, it was <laughs> but now <watch> go. <laughs> but but everything in between was was pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> pretty bad, right? Yep. Uh yeah. So Anyway, but now it's good. Uh, I mean, that's four. They have four fullbacks that are mm -hmm. all. I mean, so you have Vitor Costa on the is a natural left footer. Jamar Ricketts right. is a left footer. Um, you know mm -hmm. who's who's growing into Paul his Marie role. Right. Paul Marie has been you know great. Carlos Acapo I actually think is low key one of the most solid, consistent players He's on the team. Excellent. I, yeah. I don't think people realize like how challenging it is to pick up a good fullback in this league. Yep. Like oftentimes, if you have a, a fullback who is better than just the median, then you have one of the best fullbacks in the league period because like everybody just kind of functions at this lower level and, and, and it's honor, really hard to find somebody who is, who is heading above better, somebody who can overlap, totally. somebody who can contribute offensively and somebody who is staunch defensively as well. Yeah. And well, Brian Hoover <laughs> to honor his, his most recent <laughs> is, yeah, good transition. Tommy Thompson <laughs> is sort of a fullback, um, but it's actually yeah. a really good example of, you know, a fullback can be a couple different things and it's really hard to find a fullback who can be effective an effective defender and an effective attacker. Uh, Carlos Acapo is, is one of those people. Um, and, and that's hard to find. Even Paul Marie can struggle defensively at times. So, so the fact that, you know, you have somebody that solid is really good. And by the way, you even mentioned Oscar Verhoeven, who's a really strong prospect uh, as right back too. So, you know, they're, they're solid all around as a fullback. Um, but let's, 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 let's wind this back to Bruno's press conference and then we'll do which yeah. is kind of in order the thing that uh, struck me about uh bruno in terms of what he was saying was two things one was the attitude thing that i was talking about i think the mentality was impressive until the dam broke and i think that they showed good spirit and i think that my problem was more of kind of like what happened after that um but I, I think that he's right to point out that the spirit that they showed until that was pretty good the other thing though was he he explicitly said like we were dropping too deep you know we 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 were getting our, our defensive line was too low um, and I think that there was, you know, it's, Lucci didn't say it quite as bluntly, 
Um, but you could tell him, you know, from what he was shouting on the sidelines that that was also something he saw. That's kind of the problem there. Um, and, and you don't have to be, I, w- <laughs> I was at a match last fall uh, where Tottenham played Chelsea and they were down to nine men uh, pretty early on in the game and they had to defend and they kept on pushing their back line all the way up to the, the midway line, the half line, uh, which was, you know, an insane thing to see because no other coach does it that way. But I'll tell you what, it kind of worked to a certain extent because it kept their their defensive structure the way it was supposed to be. And it kept enough pressure going the other way to prevent Chelsea from going entirely uh, forward and having pure comfort on the ball. That was the problem that Houston that came with Houston today is Houston had no fear whatsoever that they were going to get countered. And they were very comfortable on the ball, except the points where they got really, really close to the goal. So I understand it's a deflected goal that finally goes in. But that's what happens when you're sitting incredibly deep. If people just keep pumping balls in there, occasionally there's going to be a bounce and it's going to you know, fall against your direction. So the players, the coach, everybody seems to kind of understand that they, they, they went a little bit too low. Um, and, and it'll be for them to figure out how to kind of get that out. But I, I do think that this is one of the problems. I actually think that Lucci mm-hmm. has has largely set up a good tactical system here. It's a very solid structure, uh, but he does have a little bit of a tendency to fall a little bit too deep, a little bit too passive. Uh, and, and that's the part right. that didn't work for me tonight. Well, it, it seemed like it was only a matter of time. And let's, you know, let's also talk about, because we did ask Bruno about his relationship with both Rodriguez and, and William Yarbrough, yeah. um, in case folks couldn't hear that question as well. Um, that was the first one that that I, I had brought up, and William Yarbrough like stood on his head tonight. It, you know, he had some sure. really incredible saves. He had a double save, and actually, I think it was the the second goal that was off of a save. Right, it was a corner kick. Yarbrough yep. makes a really nice save, but the deflection lands at the feet of one of the Houston players, who then scores. Um, but it and on that so back in addition post, to the way, there was the two Houston players and, and just Jackson Ewell to cover both of them and and they'll go through mm. that. It's uh, it's harder to keep marking obviously when you're down a man uh, when you're marking set pieces, but they clearly were you know Absolutely. they were outnumbered on that side and that's tough. Uh, and and he roofed it. I mean, it's a you know maybe yeah. something that was saveable, but it was it, it's hard, uh, especially after Absolutely. you know resetting your feet after a save like that. Yeah, and that was kind of the expectation too. And then maybe, I mean, that's maybe that's the way that that Lucci sees it um, here. Obviously, he's disappointed yeah. because they weren't able to keep it together. But uh, to be honest, it, it was a bit of an unlucky instance on the first goal. That was a deflection, although it was they were applying a lot of pressure, and perhaps it was only a matter of time. But the second goal was certainly a matter of being outnumbered. I think you hit it. You know, you, yeah. you stated it perfectly there. They, you also, just don't have way, enough men. Three minutes mark. after yeah. you concede and, the first time, as I said, mentally, it's just really hard to stay solid. Once oh, you yeah. Have that damn break. Well, when you're yeah. watching, you know, when your team has been defending the entire match and then suddenly your game plan has to shift a little bit, right? Um, what do you do? Do you continue to defend or do you try to yeah. go on the front foot and score a goal in order to, to kind of put it back into the situation that you were prior? Um, let's take a moment to thank Marcelo Bar- uh, Bariga for his 499 donation to Quake's Epicenter. He says, I'm hoping the FO is still looking for a DP or a designated player. It's also time to move Gruy. So shout out to everyone at Quake's Epicenter. Um, you are our off the field DP. Thank you so much for your comment, Marcelo, and for it's your 499 kind. contribution. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So I, I know that we've are, talked about way, this a lot during the season, but oh, go ahead, Colin. Uh, yeah. I, I, for the DP thing, I think that, it, that front office is absolutely still looking for a DP. Uh, there's no doubt at all. Um, and the, the one problem, though, is that this this time of year in March, very difficult to find anybody who's willing to sell to you uh, because the European yeah. leagues, they're kind of in the final third or the final quarter of their season. They're not going to sell a guy who's meaningful and important to them you know, while they're pursuing whatever their goals are. And then for the leagues in typically in the Americas that kind of run from the spring to the summer or through the spring to the winter. Um, th- they're not going to sell their guys either kind of like early on in their season. So it's, it's just an uncomfortable time of the year. The best time to do business is in January, uh, December, January mm-hmm. kind of period, or in that kind of July, you know, June, July, August period. This is a very And that goes without time. mentioning the fact that good player. there are other squads looking for the same, for similar playmakers, right? And the like I had mentioned earlier in finding good fullbacks in the league, finding a good central attacking midfielder has also been really challenging. Um you know, throughout the history of the league as well. Uh, of course, there have been a lot of really fantastic players who have come through and the Quakes are capable of signing such a player, especially if they're willing to spend the money, um, which is what it's going to take, right? If you're a team who's yeah. playing and you're consistently at the bottom of the table, you kind of, you don't have as much leverage as some of the other squads do. You don't have as much leverage as LAFC, right? 
a team that has proven that they're willing to go out and pay for players, uh, that they have a system that works, that they're a championship winning well, team, that you have, it, yeah. It's not just at LAFC now. You're you're falling behind supporting Kansas City and Vancouver Absolutely. Whitecaps and FC Dallas. It's, that's, I think, to me, that's the change in this league is there were always a couple of high, high, high spending teams that were, you know, obviously it's easy to get jealous of when, Carl, you know, t- Toronto FC was throwing money at everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah. Atlanta has and LAFC has at times. I think that the thing that scares me now is that it's we're not talking about the big prestige franchises with a whole bunch of money and free spending owners. We're talking about the middle class of the league is starting to push away from where the quakes are. Um, Mm. But I think the team is willing to spend. Uh, I've just argued on this podcast and on our website that the problem is that the bar for spending is just higher. Um, You know, Carlos Vela, they would be happy to write the check, but they have to make sure they do it at a number that for them is very, 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 very valuable. And so obviously they can't get there. No surprise. So they, they need to be more aggressive. But the problem, you know, chat, I'm not going to lie to you. Like this time of year is really hard to fill those slots I've been talking about. Uh, this is mm-hmm. this is a problem that honestly was created in December. You know, whenever they were whenever the ownership in front of front office got together to decide what their budget was and what targets were. You know, that's where this problem got created. Yeah. All right. So before we go into the last segment of the show, which is our final thoughts before the match against Austin FC, I wanted to direct folks over to quakesepicenter.com. There's actually a brand new article that just came out that Colin wrote uh, talking about the changes that occurred that uh, allowed for the Quakes to win the match against the Seattle Sounders at home. Uh, It's a great article. It makes some really great points. But in order to see it, you have to become a patron. So for two dollars a month, you can become a patron for early access, of course, as uh, as you had just mentioned recently, Colin, in regards to your articles uh, at, through the Quakes Epicenter account on Twitter, which you should also follow, the articles also become available free for folks after yep. a short period of Both time. Both my so articles the are point now is, open for everybody. So go ahead and check Oh, out. there we go. So they're, they're all open. But moving forward, uh, to get early access to the articles written by Colin, Jamin, Ane, Dominic, a lot of the great writers that we have, Robert Jonas, uh, for Quakes Epicenter. If you become a patron for $2 a month, you get that early access. If you become a patron at the $5 a month tier, you also get access to our Slack where you can join us throughout the week. You can join us during the games to chat. Colin's often on there. We have Asher Cohn, who is in his own right, uh, uh, has written a lot about the league, about uh, sports um, and a lot of different facets. And so he's like a really well-rounded presence there on the Slack. You also have Jamin and Alex Morgan who are there quite often. Um, And hopefully we'll be getting them back next week as well. As it turns out, a lot of us have very busy schedules and things didn't quite line up. So really glad that we were able to put this together for everybody tonight. Um, so here's my well, here's my Phil, concluding thought I, here, Colin, as they go uh, on. Well, the, Phil, if I could well, down before the road. you get to. Yeah. Before mm-hmm. a, a concluding thought, I just wanted to ask because we didn't talk about it at all. And maybe there's a reason. Uh, was there anything that stood out to you about Lucci's comments during his press conference? Um, you know, what? I think that for. This match, and we've seen this at, after other matches throughout the season, Lucci, there was a little bit of resignation. I mean, it, it's a lot of it is out of his hands, right? Um, in terms of player choices, in terms of what's happening on the pitch, yeah. and for his team to get I mean, let's face it, a, a red card in the 33rd minute is almost impossible to come back from, even if you have a goal lead in a match. You're likely to, in the very least, leave with a point, uh, more than likely leave with nothing, which is what ended up happening. But you know, one of the subs that he made tonight was a player, as well as he did, who had never had like professional minutes before. So this is indicative of the choices that Lucci has. So I did see some comments earlier in the chat where people were like Lucci out. And I, I really don't think that that is the problem. I don't think Lucci Gonzalez is the problem with this team. You know, um, there might be some choices that he makes in terms of substitutions that we don't agree with. There might be some tactical approaches that we don't agree with uh, that we've stated here on the show, especially Alex. But if you look at the you know what he's doing coming into these matches putting the front foot forward and trying to score every time scoring in the first minute there's a lot that he is doing right and uh, i don't think that lucci should be on the hot seat for folks who are talking about that already um but again i you know thinking about his comments colin i just think that he's kind of in that headspace right now where it's a lot of just crap that he has to get through in order to get some stability the sad thing is like after the last match, when we saw Nico go out and play so well, as well as he did against the Sounders, the hope was that that was going to be some of that stability that the team needed to continue moving forward. Um, 
And, and we didn't get that tonight because of the circumstances, because they were playing on the road in Houston. I mean, that's another thing that we didn't really uh, yeah. press upon. Houston's is, been that's one of the best factor. defensive teams in the league, too. That, too. And Lucci had said in the midweek press conference, which, by the way, another call for folks to join our Patreon, um, during the midweek press conference, which is available through our Patreon um, every week, Lucci had stated that Houston actually had one of the lower XGs against in their in their defensive area and so they were like a really hard team to break down once they're in a block and the quakes were able to get a goal off of a set piece i mean off of a corner kick right which was perfect but at times you know had they gotten nico into the mix i think that they might have had opportunities to break some of those lines do some of the things that he'd been looking to do with nico throughout the season of course we didn't get to see that and the evidence doesn't show that that was going to happen considering we didn't get a whole lot of Nico in that first yeah. 30 minutes and then he got subbed out, right? So I don't know exactly how that's going to look. But um, going into the game against Austin, um, my hope is that we will get to see a little bit more of Nico Chakiris featured. He's going to have a little bit more rest because he didn't play a full 90. Um, but he's also not going to have Jackson Yule there in the midfield with him, who at times has been one of the more stable pieces. Um, yeah. Will we see Alfredo Morales there? Will we see Carlos Groves? So I think that's a question that's going to be answered once we see the the lineup um, an hour before the match. So that's going to be one of the keys for me is how is Nico going to bounce back from this performance where he only had like, he had if even a dozen touches. I don't even know if he made it to that many because I didn't go back and look at the stats, but he wasn't very much involved. If we can get the Nico that we saw during the Seattle Sounders match, despite some of the losses that the Quakes are going to have going into the game against Austin, they might actually stand a chance because Austin is not a very good team. Um, even at home, they haven't looked very great this season. Uh, I think they might have picked up a win tonight, but that has kind of been going, that, that kind of goes against the way that they've performed throughout yeah. the season. And so I think that the Quakes can possibly, at the very least, pick up a point, but possibly even more. But again, not having Jackson Yule in the lineup, uh, bringing back J Jeremy Abobasi after having Preston Judd and how he looked and how well he performed, that's also going to change the dynamic a bit. So it's going to be a lot to, it's going to be like a lot of question marks going into this match. Um, either way, uh, yeah. excited to see Nico get back out there, Colin. And I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are going into this match as well. Yeah, look, uh, I, I, I prompt you with the, like, what, what you noticed with uh, Luigi's press conference. Uh, I'll give you my brief one, and then we're going to hit two comments here who've been put in. Um, but uh, my, the one thing that stood out to me because Lucci said ex the exact same thing in Spanish and in English when he was answering this, he's like, I'm really proud of my guys. You know, I'm, I'm proud yeah. of my guys. And uh, I know there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of people who, when they're frustrated after a game, probably want the coach to just fry their team. And let me tell you, I'm sure he's frying the guys who, who made, you know, like Preston Judd, he's saying you can't do that. And, you know, he'll be, he'll get into the people who need to get into, but it's not really the place for the coach to to cook them in in the press conference and the media, um, mm -hmm. but I actually think he he is is right to be proud of his guys for the way that they stood tall for eighty minutes. Um, and I think that one of the things that this team needs is confidence. And when they got their confidence broken in that eightieth minute, you saw the frustration come through. So you know there there's something that kind of needs to be built there, and that's kind of what stood out for me as well. Is that I think that the pride the pride is genuine. But I also think it's something that is necessary to kind of recover the the confidence of this group. Um, but anyway, we're gonna we're gonna big shout out to uh, and a big thank you to Dante and Brian for um, for their donations as well. I think that Dante actually makes a good point. That oh, I this is actually a good yet, point. I, I was gonna bring yeah. this up. I, I completely forgot. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Go defenders ahead, scoring and a lot of set pieces <laughs> scoring, um, and that's I think that is genuinely indicative that they're not scoring a lot from open mm -hmm. play, uh, and and that's, that's yeah. concerning. It's a mixture. I'm going to read the comment aloud for the folks who are listening yeah. in, in podcast form too. Um, just so this is Dante Corona. Thank you for your donation, uh, Dante, or your contribution to Quakes Epicenter 499. Um, he says still concerning that our defense is scoring more than our offense, and and yeah, there is a concern there. Yeah. And but also, if you want to put a little bit of a spin on it, um, contributions from this part of the field, especially on set pieces, have been a challenge for the Quakes over the years. And so it's good to see guys like Bruno Wilson, <laughs> yeah, nice to have like it. Vitor Costa, step in and actually contribute offensively. And so. That's a positive. Although um, I was looking before the match, Colin, one other concern that I had that I didn't talk about as well is the Quakes have actually leaked a lot of goals this season as well. So that's that's going to be an issue moving forward. So we'll see we'll see how that how that balances out as they continue to score because that that can be the trade off oftentimes, right? If you are if you're pushing forward to be more aggressive, you're leak through more goals, and we've certainly seen a lot of yeah. that. Um, okay, let, let's go. Thank to you, the next to Brian, as here. well. Phil, I'll give you a read. He's a professional read man. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not. Well, actually, I, technically, I am. Yeah, you but... <laughs> kind of are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't look at my auto audio books, folks. There, you know. Actually, there's a couple of really. There's. A, I, I can't say that because that's that's bad for the authors. Um, support the yeah, authors yeah. whose whose books that I've read and are published currently, um, in audio format through Audible. Um, <laughs> Brian Hubler, thank you for your five dollar contribution. He says, "Shout out to Kiwi for always giving us a show where we can drown our sorrows." <laughs> Love that, love that. Misery loves company, Brian. Um, and he says big ups to me for uh for to Phil, he says, for killing it as producer and host. I really appreciate that. Um, first night producing, as Colin had mentioned earlier. It's it's not that challenging, it's just like working through the little things, you know, yeah, switching it's between harder to do it the during the, the show. parts of the browser, making sure the audio is working properly. So um, but I do know now, and then they actually told me this and I didn't listen. I need to leave myself unmuted on StreamYard so people can hear the question that I'm asking. I was so proud of myself that I phrased the questions so professionally and then nobody <laughs> got to hear them. So I'm disappointed in that. And then you asked me afterwards, what did you ask? And I'm all, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't even like think of the right thing. So um, yeah. anyway, really appreciate that, Brian and Dante. Thank you guys for your contributions to the show. Um, Colin, you have any other thoughts before we get no, out of here? No, we, we can push it to a wrap. Um, look, I think that this is, a, this is trending towards a sad season, um, which is you know, t tough. Uh, but th there is something to build on here. As I said, there is a building, a tactical building block that works for me. And there's a, a mentality building block that works for me. Uh, the real question is, is, are they going to give them the firepower to, to go beyond just that kind of basic building block? Um, and as I said, it's really hard to do this time of the year. So they got to figure out something that works before they can get the reinforcements in the summer. And I think that that you know, that's really putting a lot of risk on it. And I, you know, I blame a, a mixture of the ownership in the front office for not sorting something out um, again, starting in December and January when this would have been a lot easier. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think it's going to close it out for tonight. So I want to direct folks again to quakesepicenter.com. Make sure to follow us on social media at Quakes Epicenter on Instagram, on Twitter. You can find us on both of those uh, social media services. And now I got to figure out how to put up the final logo as we end the show. Thanks for watching.